Welcome, everybody. This is SharePoint Financial Practices, a bi-weekly community call around the general SharePoint development. And basically, this is the community call around everything else except SharePoint framework and JavaScript development within a SharePoint. So in this community call, uh, we talk about architectural designs. We talk about end-to-end -end, end -to -end solutions. We talk about provisioning solutions, automation solutions, APIs, and all of that. So all of the non-SharePoint framework-specific uh, topics. And which is a pretty broad, actually, area. And so we've been covering uh, BMP in the past. We've been covering provisioning logistics, uh, PowerShell, and all of that. And we'll be doing that in the future here as well. Uh, this time, uh, we won't actually have Microsoft uh, Flow or Power Apps content in here, which we typically have, because uh, Chax is super, 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 super busy on getting stuff ready for Ignite. So Ignite is coming uh, within a month. Actually, yeah, precisely a month from now, uh, Ignite is there, and we are getting ready for ship uh, some func uh, some capabilities and functionalities. So, anyway, uh, that's uh, from an introduction perspective what this uh, general dev seek is all about. Uh, so we do have uh, actually at least once a week a SharePoint developer community call, and all of these calls are getting recorded. So you can always go to our YouTube channel to get the recording. Uh, there's uh, at least a uh, tech community post uh, defining what's actually inside of the calls as well. Um, and you can always follow up on the social media to see the agendas for these calls. Uh, so we release always a detailed agenda for these calls already before uh, the call actually starts in the Twitter using the SharePoint or Office Dev or my account. Now, opportunities to participate with the community, obviously there's multiple different ways of engaging uh, with SharePoint community. Um, you are more than welcome uh, to demonstrate a solution or a technical pattern uh, within this uh, SharePoint Dev community calls. Today, we kind of have Chris Kent and Patrick Rogers doing stuff. Uh, Chris is actually helping us on the column formatting documentation and samples, which is coming out pretty soon, so it was kind of logical to let him also to demonstrate that in practice today. But uh... Did it happen? Have we lost Vesa this early into the call? I think we have. That's sort of amazing. Ah, new record, three minutes in. So, uh, as Vesa was saying, uh, we absolutely uh, encourage anyone uh, who's interested. We are oh, learning from he's what's back. actually happening. Oh, what's that? Insane. <laughs> we couldn't hear you for about a minute. <sighs> okay, so somebody needs to tell me uh, when I'm actually, <laughs> when I'm, I didn't watch the Iron Window, so uh, I should have actually watched that. Okay. Anyway, thank you, uh, Patrick. So anybody who's interested, please reach out uh, for me, Patrick, uh, or anybody in the BMP team uh, for uh, for uh, getting a spot uh, in this course. Now, SharePoint framework calls are super popular for demos. Right now, our next available spot for SharePoint framework is on the week of Ignite. So uh, we have quite a lot of uh, demos in the queue. But feel free, if you're interested in doing those still, uh, we will get you a spot uh, in the future things as well. Now, contribute in a kit absolutely a good solution as well, or provide feedback using social media channels uh, um, is absolutely welcome as well. Now, on today's agenda, a few general announcements and updates on the general development. Then I wanted to have one slide, uh, kind of a clarify the hub or sub discussion. Um, I know that yesterday in the SharePoint uh, Fest in Seattle, this was a topic for Mark Cashman as well. Uh, so w is, is it recommended to use hub sites or sub sites? So why did we, we've been promoting a hub site model for a long time, but then we introduced the modern sub site. So what's with that? So let's have a quick discussion on that one. I'm not going to deep dive on the topic. I'm not going to do a live demos on that, uh, but um, kind of a high-level discussion and interesting to see your input on the Iron Window as well. Then we'll give the most time for Chris uh, showing uh, the view uh, preview of upcoming view formatting capability. So like I said, uh, Chris has been working and helping us on the documentation updates and also on the sample updates on the upcoming view formatting uh, capabilities. So uh, thank you, Chris, for those. And your samples are absolutely flawless, so they're looking really cool. Um, so we'll see plenty of those uh, later today. 
uh, I'm, see, I'm promising, over promising, hopefully, everything. And then uh, Patrick is going to uh, do a preview on upcoming open source OneDrive migration tooling. So this is around getting files moved to the OneDrive platform uh, from your on-premises side. Um, so that's going to be a shorter demo uh, in the end. I think it was 10 minutes, if I remember correctly, from Patrick's time. Now. Let's actually get moving. A few slides, uh, the typical slides, uh, documentation and guidance, AKMS SP DevDocs. Uh, we are, uh, I've been pushing updates on the web parts and SPFX and a few other updates during this week. We're updating this documentation all the time. Pretty soon you will see actually Microsoft Flow and Power Apps related documentation uh, on SharePoint context in here as well. Um, and we're working on additional uh, guidance and documentation here as well. So keep on following what happens here. Uh, it is absolutely the, the best possible source for the truth on the latest guidance, what we have. Now, there is a lot of documents out there. Some of them are unfortunately outdated, but you're more than willing, uh, welcome to add a comment or submit an issue or even submit a pull request. There is actually an edit button uh, in the service, which will give you the capability of suggesting an edit on the article. And it's nothing more than actually clicking the, clicking the edit button and then submitting a call request. Please uh, feel free to do so. And those are more than welcome. Now, the second thing what I want to pinpoint, uh, a typical slide in these calls, is the issue list. So uh, on the SharePoint dev issues, so if you're running the API issues, ex expected, ex unexpected situation with APIs, customization, whatever, uh, please let us know using the AKMS SP dev issue list. Uh, um, we actually are having now a, a small group of, uh, um, how would I put it, support engineers helping us uh, starting uh, actually today. Uh, that will take a while to actually catch up truly, but uh, we will have additional people working and doing labeling and doing triaging of these items in the future. And that's really for there to help on catch up uh, on, on your reports and making sure that uh, we are more responsive on what are you actually telling because, well, to be honest, personally, I don't scale that easily uh, anymore and other people don't scale that, that much anymore either. So the support guys are helping there in the future. Now, one thing what I wanted to also remind, uh, SharePoint Starter Kit, uh, AKMS SPS Dev Starter Kit, this is uh, a combination of end-to-end -end solution provisioning, automated provisioning on SharePoint Online and SharePoint Framework. Um, it is this humongous amount of cool demos and capabilities within this one, including the source code. So, And you are more than willing to use the source code any way you want uh, within your customizations. Ignite will actually have a full uh, automated setup uh, in a way that you can sign, go to a website and you can sign in and then say, hey, I want to provision this to my site and boom, magically it will provision that within the following 10 minutes. And that is progressing really nicely. That will also include uh, significant updates and changes in the PMP provisioning engine, uh, which we will talk about more at least global latest in the September monthly community call. But there's super cool stuff uh, coming on the automation side uh, in the tooling. Now, uh, a few updates on the dev roadmap. So obviously the number one things and the most important things for us is the, is the SharePoint framework. Right now is the SharePoint framework. Uh, so SharePoint framework 1.6 is still estimated to come alive or public, uh, going to be published uh, by end of August. So you can pretty much now conclude um, that it's going to happen next week. It's, I can promise that it's not going to happen this week. So during next week, we'll release a 1.6. So that's currently the plan, uh, unless we'll find a really late, uh, last minute uh, critical thing. I did find a, a nasty thing earlier today uh, when I was doing uh, internet testing on certain things, and we're fixing that, uh, but that shouldn't delay the release of 1.6. 1.7 is scheduled to go live slightly after actually Ignite. Uh, so uh, do actually Ignite freeze periods and everything else for SharePoint Online. Uh, it's going to go live like a week or two after Ignite. But in Ignite, we're going to announce uh, what's precisely included in 1.7. There's some new capabilities which are not even mentioned in here, but you'll get a clue on what's included in those releases. Uh, a few points maybe on the on the release plan, which has been moved. So SharePoint 2019 Yeoman support, unfortunately, is delayed until 1.7. Uh, the socket I.O. preview is unfortunately delayed to 1.7, and the React 16 support is in the 1.7 as well. So 1.6 is around the native graph access um, and third-party API calls uh, in GA, Dialog Framework GA, and then the global or tenant-wide deployment of SharePoint Framework extensions, uh, and documentation will be released together with that one. 
Now, uh, there's a question from uh, Valentin. Uh, what, is, what about GA of AAD HTTP client? That's part of the native graph access uh, from SharePoint Framework GA. So that is meant to go live in 1.6. Um, and that's our 100% uh, our intention. So that's going to happen next week. Uh, so after that, you can actually start using the graph and Azure AD uh, API calls uh, securely from SharePoint Framework uh, in production, which is super cool. Now, um, the few slides what I wanted to actually take, I'm not going to take too much time because I know that Chris has plenty of cool uh, content waiting there. But this is actually a really interesting discussion because I got this question so many times during last week, so I wanted to have a one slide uh, available on this one. And this is around the, the Hapit or Sapit or Hapify or Sapify. These are not actually official terms. They're just terms invented by me. But the question is really around, should we use hub sites in SharePoint Online or subsites in SharePoint Online. Uh, there was a one MVP who, who noted in, in Twitter that, well, wait a minute. So for the past year since Ignite, you've been kind of promoting the hub sites as the facto model for SharePoint Online, and now you introduce the modern subsite. What's with that? Well, the reality is that it's not black and white. And the recommendation, what we are saying, and actually Mike, Mark Cashman said it really well yesterday in the SharePoint Fest, is that you should hop before you sub. And that's probably a good quote. <laughs> and somebody quoted his session from uh, SharePoint Fest Seattle. So I'm actually quoting that one in here as well. So the recommendation is, is in SharePoint Online to use the hub site design if that's suitable for you, um, if that's possible. Because the hub site design is basically single site site collection. And that's much more scalable model, much more reusable model, much more efficient and perf uh, model uh, for SharePoint Online in SharePoint Online infrastructure. This minimizes the perf issues uh, related, for example, unique permissions and structural navigations uh, in the context of classical uh, classic purposing sites, which is one of the key kind of a classic challenges what we've been having in SharePoint Online. And this absolutely scales better uh, in SharePoint Online. As part of this uh, hub site investment, so the hub site is evolving all the time. Uh, this week we announced additional capabilities like creating more hub sites in a tenant. You can have up to 100 hub sites in a tenant, and then are able to link across uh, those site collections to your hubs. Uh, there's a, a uh, automatic, uh, let's say, execution of actions when a site is being associated to a hub site, as an example. So site scripts can be executed as part of that, or a flow, or whatever. So those are available as part of the hub sites. Uh, there's some additional capabilities available. Uh, there was a blog post in the Microsoft Tech community around this announcement uh, earlier this week. Uh, you can have a look on the Microsoft Tech community or uh, the SharePoint Twitter account uh, for reference on that one. Um, the modern subsites are also available in SharePoint Online. This is something which was, I think we released this in uh, mid-July, if I remember correctly. And they are, from a technic technical perspective, there are SDS has three. And they are actually same. It is the, exactly the same site definition, which is in SharePoint 2019, as the modern site collection or a modern subsite. So you can use a modern subsite as well. But it is more recommended to use hub sites where suitable. Uh, but then if hub site isn't matching your requirement, then you can fall back on the modern subsites as well. Um, as a high level of guidance. So this is kind of a gray area, and I know that from a um, a special community always would love to have really black and white statements. Use hubs, not subs. No, but that's that's something what we cannot actually uh, cannot actually do. So it is around it is around uh, gray area. So you need to match your business requirements and then find the suitable model for you uh, right now, uh, which is the right way of doing that. Um, I added two different uh, pictures there. There is a subsite creation option at settings in a tenant level. So if you go to a an audio as long as the no. can people hear me? Can people hear me? Can people? I can hear you. Okay, cool. So, okay, good, 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 good. So, cool. So, um, so there is a subsite uh, creation option uh, in the tenant admin settings, uh, which you can use to manage. Is the subsite available uh, for classic sites only or for modern experiences only? And then, if you are interested on the modern subsite, if you go to a any site collection in SharePoint Online, if you create a subsite. There is actually now a team site without the classic experience node, and that is the modern subsite. So that's basically what's available. 
No, no. Uh, oh, da, 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 da. Yes. Um, and on the, on the, let's say, on the statement, thank you, Vincent, on, on quoting me. Uh, so in general, um, uh, in general, on the hub sites and sub sites and everything else, we're looking into improving our documentation on this one. But again, this is a big, big, big challenge for us. Our dev, dev uh, technical writer uh, resources are pretty limited, so we can't really up make everything up to date all the time, as, and that means that some of our documentation is out of date. So, but you can actually help us. Go to the article, click edit button on top right corner of the article, and, and suggest your edit. That would be extremely valuable for us uh, for making sure that these are up to date. Um, no limit on the associating sites to the hub site, so that there's no limit on that. Uh, but on, with hub sites, you cannot have a hub site associated to a hub site, so you can't really have a deep hierarchy. It's a single level uh, hierarchy from that perspective. Good. Uh, cool. Moving forward on things, I think that was everything what I had uh, on that one. Just a quick uh, discussion point on that because I wanted to have make sure that we have plenty of time for Chris and then Patrick and potentially also Q&A in the end. Uh, I will check the questions in the iron window uh, as Chris will start his presentation um, if I missed something and, and trying to answer all of those. But Chris, your stage. All right. Let me share the screen here. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yep. All good. Loud and clear. Ooh. All right. That's already a first thing. All right. Oh, it looks weird. Can you guys see the screen? It's weird to get. Uh, All yep. right. Okay. Well, some people can. It's okay. This is just the picture of me, so don't worry. You'll catch up. Um, so this is who I am. I'm Chris Kent. Uh, follow me on the Twitter tweets. Got a blog. There you go. All right. That's my family. Woo. Got one wife, three children so far. I'm the wife. Okay. So let's take a look. We're going to talk today about Office 365 list formatting, uh, which is also technically in a sort of way also 2019 column formatting. Uh, but the whole idea here is this declarative modern list view customization. For those that don't remember or have seen this yet. It's the idea of column formatting has been around a while. I think it came out in November. Uh, it's got this JSON syntax. All right, you apply it directly to your list fields, your site columns. You can go right to the field settings. You could format the column menu, right? You come in here and you paste, and it's all magical and everything works great. All right, the key thing to note with column formatting, we'll talk about why this is key, um, is that it's stored with the field itself, right? So anywhere you use the site column or that field on all views for a list, right, or multiple lists for using that site column, uh, that formatting is applied. All right, so that's that's your refresher on that. It ends up with stuff like this. So you can do all sorts of really cool, pretty things on your columns. All right, everything you're seeing here, by the way, is a sample that's available to you. Um, so we'll talk about that repo here in a little bit, but each one of these you can grab and just apply to your columns as needed. Okay, but that's what that is. But now there's something brand new. It's very exciting. Um, for those of you that have been following the documentation, you may have actually seen this. It's been out for a couple of weeks, um, but it was kind of sneakily put in there, and this is the first time we're really talking about it. In the past, we've had this thing called abstract syntax tree, which is really just that operator operand stuff, right? You can go crazy with your nesting, um, and you have to, right, if you want to combine any of your expressions together, right? If you want to add three screens, you know, three strings together, but one of those strings you want to do a quick if, right? you got to nest all of that, and it gets quickly kind of crazy. So now we've got this new thing called Excel-style expressions. Ah, it's beautiful. It's wonderful, right? Everything is on a single line. You can easily combine your expressions. So if you want to do a plus and an if, you can do all that in the same line. Um, it's very easy, and it's full of electrolytes. Uh, it's awesome. Use it. Uh, every sample in column formatting has been updated to use that. Uh, so we've got both versions, right, because this is something that's only going to be for 2019, the Excel style expressions for column formatting, and you'll be stuck with these, uh, these abstract syntax trees. But that's all right. They still work great. So let's take a look real quick. So this is kind of the classic example, right? Uh, this is where you're taking the severity field and you're applying an icon in one of those SP field severity classes. So if you take a look, this is the original sample for that. You can see we've got our operator, right, and our operands. And you can see 
you get the nesting down there, right? You've got a little if with this question mark, but it has to check if current field equals done, and if so, apply good, and then it goes on, on, and on, and on, and on, forever, and ever, and ever, down, 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 All right? So this one's got 100 and, what is it, 133 lines in it, right, just to get that. But let's take a look at what that might look like with Excel style expressions. Here's the new sample. Um, it's down to 23 lines. Uh, if we take a look at an example here, the icon, right, all in a single line, we're just saying if the current field equals equals done, make it a checkmark icon, right? And then the else, we just fill with another if statement, right? So you can quickly see how we're doing basically a switch statement all in a single line, and it's super easy to read, uh, you know, really reduces the complexity here. You can see other examples of that, like here's a real simple one, just string concatenation, all right, in the past, you had to write that it was like four or five lines, right, with an array of operands, which included your first part of your URL and then your current field. Again, this is way easy to read. It's a lot better. Um, every sample's got it. So if you're looking to transition, take a look at the samples. Uh, they will give you plenty of examples of how to do that. Again, we've got like 28 different samples, and they each have one of these AST files and the new one. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about something even newer. It's not quite out yet. And that's called view formatting. Uh, you've heard it called row formatting various times. Uh, marketing's gotten together and says view formatting. We'll see why. So this is a superset of column formatting. So we'll take a look at the demo here, but the whole idea is you apply it directly to the views. So just like in the column menu, there's, you know, where you can edit the format, the current column, you can format your current view here. Click that, you get a very similar box. It even says column formatting right now, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, and you paste that and you get magic, right? Now, well, unlike the column formatting where it's, you know, applied to the field, this is stored with the view, which is very different. Uh, the whole idea here is you can have multiple view formats on a single list, which can be really, really powerful, right? So you can look at it in a cool way on this way and in a cool way on that way. Let's, let's get to some demos here. But first, let's talk about the two different types. There's two types. There's one where you're just going to apply a classes to the row. Uh, this works really well with column formats, so you can have both uh, these things. It's very simple. You don't have to do any of the rendering of the fields itself. You're just applying a class, right? So if you want to throw a color on there, so it's not styles, but if you want to use, like, the, the MSBG color uh, classes from UI Fabric, all of those work, or you want to use those SP field severities, uh, you can apply those, and those go right over the top of all your standard rendering of columns and including anything that's called formatting. The other style is full formatting, which is where we're going to apply this row formatting, a row formatter property. And this is going to override column formats because it overrides everything. You're responsible for drawing the whole thing, which gives you a ton of freedom to make some really powerful stuff. View formatting also allows you to hide the column headers and remove that whole ability to select items. All right. And it's not out. Vesta, do you want to comment on, on the timing of that at all? Uh, it's super soon coming uh, <laughs> in matter of days rather than months, uh, somewhere in there. So <laughs> soon, soon. 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 soon, soon, very soon, soon and very soon. All right, here we go. So I mentioned these things. So this is a hide list header. So by default, it's false. So just put a true there, and now you don't have any column headers. Woo. Hiding selection, this only works if you're doing the, so it doesn't work if you're just doing the additional class style, right? But if you're doing the row formatter, uh, you can hide that selection, which can be really helpful, and you can handle those through those custom row actions. We'll see. So additional row classes is really simple. You can use those expressions, right, to look at a field in the list and say, like, hey, is it overdue? Make it red, the whole thing red, right? Very easy to do. Um, but it's only applied when row formatter is not specified. The other option is specify row formatter and everything in there. If you actually look at the schema for this thing, right, it's just got these four properties, and that fourth one just references the column formatting schema. So everything in column formatting is supported in row formatter. It's actually using the same code behind the scenes. Uh, fun fact also, uh, Excel, Excel style expressions are just being converted to AST before being processed. So fun stuff. All right, let's take a look. Woo. Okay, so we'll back to our Warrior Horses site. All right, we'll go over here to our list. We've got this very exciting list. We're just going to take a look at view formatting. And I would like to highlight all the things that are assigned to me, right? Like, I want to know right when I get here what's going on here. Uh, 
Let's see, David is asking, is it also working in the web part? Yes, all these work in the web part. Okay, all right, let's see. So I go down to go my Visual Studio here. So I've got this format here. It's very simple. Let's see if we can grow that a little bit. Get rid of you. I don't need you. But you can see I've got that Excel style expression here. All I'm saying is if assigned to email equals me, then make the background color theme light. If you guys haven't seen these, by the way, these are the Office UI fabrics uh, classes. Use these because then they respect everything we do theme. So as people switch between themes, including light and dark or custom themes, you're good to go. You don't have to recreate your format. So don't put the, the hex color unless you need a very specific color directly in there. Um, this is also the only way you're going to get any hover styles. So let's grab this whole thing, copy that sucker, go back here. And you can see here I've got this Format Current View option. Click that. I get this exciting box. Paste it. And I'll preview it. Boom! I've got beautiful blue lines across the top and bottom where things are assigned to me. And again, if uh, Dan Gump or Nate Williams shows up here, theirs will be blue. All right, so we'll save that, and we're good to go. The nice thing, again, is that you can see a combination. So we've got that column formatting here. Now, if we come in here, we've applied that same view, and now we can combine those. You can imagine you can quickly get some really, really cool dashboards uh, out of just using the out-of-the-box list view. That way, all your editing, all your details panes, flows, everything is just all built for you. You don't need to go in and build some crazy stuff for that. Okay? And, you know, because these are applied specifically to view, you can have all sorts of other things in here, right? You can have crazy amounts of views all in the same data, so you can see it in various ways. All right. Now, that's cool for the additional classes. Let's see something that's a little more elaborate, right? So say you've got this kind of classic bulletin board, right, where people want to post things to sell, right? It's the old replacement for the, the public folders and Outlook, right? You've given them a list. That's great. They set up the notifications. People want to, to see stuff, right? So they've got books for sale here. Click on the title. You can see details about it. All that works pretty great. It's not super intuitive to end users. All right, so what you could do is you can format this current view, and I've got another format down here. And again, these are all samples in that library. So it's called the bulletin board format. Very clever. All right, you copy that guy. Again, I'm not going through the code, really. That's something you can look at the samples for afterwards. If I preview that, you can see we get a much nicer view. All right, it's using our custom theme here. We've got a custom teal theme. Uh, but I get this nice hover style, so as an end user, I can put this, because I've gotten rid of the selection stuff, I've gotten rid of the headers here, I could take this and put it in the web part uh, directly on a, on a page, right, and put some other stuff around it. I mean, it's super obvious how to use. People know they just click anywhere in it, right, and it's going to open up. Now, the way I'm doing that is a custom row action with the default click, uh, which you can see right here. So this is all you got to do. I wrapped everything in a button. And then I did some cool styling on it after that, right? This is just that row formatter. And I'm just saying, when everyone clicks on it, do the default thing, which in this case opens up that information panel, right? And you get all the nice details here. So this creates a really nice master detail uh, that looks good. It can match your branding. Everything works pretty well, okay? Um, and again, as you're, if you use the right themes, everything will match those themes. I'm going to skip the darks now. All right, got it? So I'm not going to do purple. Who wants purple? Okay, you got that? So now let's see something even a little more elaborate, right? So I've got this contacts list. You guys remember this whole idea of contacts? Your salespeople are managing these, right, because they didn't pony up the money for dynamics or whatever it is, right? Uh, so they've got their list here. Yeah, and that's okay, right? I can see all this information about Hannah Sullivan, right? I can click it, and I can see it, you know, in this view, all right, and that's, again, okay, but what if we can make that look a lot better? Good news, spoiler alert, we totally can. All right, I have this other one here, uh, contact cards. All right, and this one, the whole idea here is to show you some pretty elaborate stuff. So this is a really big format, so you'll want to check this out in detail there. But what it's doing, I've already applied it, is we go into cards, and we get this nice view here. All right, so we take that address, we make it into a map. Uh, we show notes. We're doing a lot of uh, conditional showing, right? So we we only show, say, the email address when they've got an email address, right? We only show the phone number when they have that. We move everything around accordingly, right? When they don't have an address, we put a nice message here, no address provided or no notes entered, 
Um, you know, we, we make it so you can click on these. You know, we'll start an email to them. So you can see it's pretty intuitive. Uh, we also have these nice little buttons over here. So these are also using those custom row actions. So we've got the idea here. I want to see more details, right? I want to open it up and I want to see that classic pane. I can maybe I have additional things here. Um, I also have the ability to directly edit this, right? So I click this and now I'm right in the edit field, right? That's the edit props default action, not default action, action. I can also choose to delete. Bye, Hannah, right? I can just hit delete here. So you can see I'm quickly getting, without having any of those, you know, headers or other the selection things, I'm getting all the functionality I want. I can't even click the share. Right, and I specifically get the share links, and I can go to town there and say, everyone contact Hannah as needed, right? If I had flows, I could add those here as well. Um, and you could have various flows that are launching here. And even even further, because you are customizing the entire thing, you're also responsible for responsive design, right? So this particular format does all that, right? So it, it automatically is responsive. Um, you can come in here, so if you switch to a mobile view, all that kind of stuff, you can use all that. So there's a ton of power in these view formats and in column formatting, especially when you start combining these things across views. And keep in mind, I'm not deploying anything. There's no solutions that have been deployed. I just need to be a site designer. I don't have to be a site collection admin. I don't have to have tenant privileges, right? I don't have to do the app catalog. And there's absolutely reasons why you would do those things, but 90% of your customizations could be handled this way, uh, which is really awesome. So it's really powerful. If they sell file expressions, it's even easier to get into. Uh, so check out some of that stuff. And I'll just close off with a couple other new things here, All right? And the idea here, this is, it's not that new. Uh, it's, ooh, let's swap that. Ooh. All right, I just want to make sure everyone's aware this didn't used to be a thing, but now it's a thing with hyperlinks, right, and this includes hyperlink and picture fields work the same way. So if you need to get that description for, like, say, a tooltip of your picture, you're just going to do this, whatever the field is, dot D-E-S-C, because description was too long to write. All right. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is because this is how you access everything in view formatting, right? So when you're doing a view format, the current field always equals the title. So to get anything else, you're going to use this internal name referencing. Right, and you're going to do the same thing you've done with column formatting, where you're going to say author.email or lookup value, any of that kind of stuff, right over to link.desc to get the description. And the last thing, this is one that's just been kind of silently added as well. You get these two new contextual properties or magic text, right? You get the windows inner height and inner width at the time of render. So these don't consistently update, right? So they don't help a ton with the responsive design. But as you're taking over a whole page for view formatting, you're going to find these are pretty helpful. All right. Yep. And last thing, make sure you're checking out the list formatting samples repo. Go to this URL right here, which, ah, apparently I can't copy and paste that. So check that out. Um, it's just github.com slash SharePoint slash SP dev list formatting. There you go. You're always on top of it. Uh, but again, there's 28 column samples or six view samples. So there's been three view samples and four column samples added in the past week alone. Uh, if you're looking for a spot to contribute, this is by far the easiest repo to contribute to, and you can become a PNP contributor, put it on your resume, get a great job, whatever you need. Okay. And then last thing is coming soon, column formatter will be renamed to list formatter, um, and you'll see that it has full support for view formatting and these Excel size expressions and all that stuff. Okay. Now, Chris, you're somehow magically assuming that people would know what that is. Oh, that's um, a good point. Yeah. Do you want to actually show that quickly? Uh, if you have something, Ooh. because we have a few minutes, so I'm saying out loud that you don't actually explain what it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll show it here in just a second. Uh, first, I'll show some tips here, so I don't have to come back cool. to the slides. Um, as you're doing these formats, use the UI Fabric classes, right? So ones that aren't working right now are Grid System, but I think that'll come later. That works on the main pages. But you get theme colors, hover styles, font sizes, and weights. You know, you can do a ton of those style properties, and that that works well. But it doesn't work well as you're switching between, uh, you know, themes, especially with those dark themes. You'd be surprised uh, what you got to do there. So use these, and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, don't use AST unless you absolutely need to, because you're suddenly on SharePoint 2019, right? So otherwise, forget it forever. Only use Excel style expressions. This is one thing I, I see a lot of people complaining about. They get weird errors. Right, that's because debug mode was left on. 
This is supported both in view formatting and column formatting, right? With view formatting, you just put it inside that row formatter. Um, the reason you get that is because blank fields, for instance, you're going to throw a message and put that right in your field. So just turn it off when you're done. It's very helpful when you're using it sometimes uh, to figure out what's going on there. If you're writing a complex one, either write the HTML first or draw it out. All right, that'll be a lot easier when you try and get in these nested elements. Uh, there's a ton of different services that provide dynamic images, like those maps. Right, that's a dynamic image, so I can set that source and just build a query string. Uh, and there's a lot of services that you know. There's a whole chart API, all sorts of other stuff out there that can do all that. Take advantage of them. There's a thousand some odd icons in the UI fabric. Use them. Test in multiple themes. So this is something, you know, I recently went through all of our uh, samples, and I found a lot of them just didn't play nice uh, in dark themes. Uh, don't surprise your end users or don't have, make them have to redo their formats. Just test it. It's really easy. Ooh, I that guy? It went backwards. All right. And then lastly, useless formatter. Let's talk about what that is. And since we're going to do an on-the-spot demo. Yeah, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, you pressure. haven't tried for this. Let's see. Uh, I don't even know what state it's in. This will be fine. <laughs> no, but it, it's it's worthwhile to actually show what it is because um, uh, we get different people in this uh, call rather than SPFX call. So, yeah. and and this is while uh, Chris is actually setting it up. It is a SharePoint framework web part which is available for you uh, from the GitHub. Uh, SharePoint SP Dev Solutions. Uh, Chris has created that. Uh, and that's basically then giving you an editor for creating these things. Now, I think Chris was saying update coming soon, so it's it's going to be updated with the latest capabilities relatively soon. Now it's starting. Woohoo! Don't believe it. It's a lie. We've got to wait a second here. <laughs> yeah, it's a relatively big one, so it takes yeah. a while to load. Now, there was a few questions uh, which we didn't actually go through. So the, on the UI where we had the editing experience and sharing experience, there was a question around, well, can those be permission aware? Uh, so showing those icons of editing and everything else. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but the answer is actually no, because uh, right. there is no uh, explicit action in JSON which we can use, at least for now, for dedicate, kind of a saying, this only for people who have an editing experience. Um, that's something that, that's kind of a good feedback, which I will route to the right people. So Cyrus is responsible, well, the engineering manager behind of this, and they will get this feedback. The, the other thing, well, actually, let's have a look on this one and then uh, talk about a few other things as well. But this is list formatter for yeah. free. So this is the new version, right? So you can see this new view formatter here. Uh, some of the things you're, you're not seeing yet are wizards here. So if you guys haven't seen this, uh, the idea here is I'm going to try and make this a little bigger. All right, we'll just grow that out. There we go. Uh, so the idea here is it's a wizard, so you don't have to go to VS Code and edit these things. Uh, you certainly can, right? It works very well uh, for a lot of stuff. But, you know, like with column formatting, we've got a series of wizards here, right? So if you wanted to take that severity one we saw earlier, Hit OK here. It'll generate all of that for you. Right now, it's generating the AST syntax. Uh, that's what's being updated now uh, to make sure we take you know, advantage of that Excel style syntax because that's a lot easier to understand and use. Um, and then you can save these directly to your field so you never have to open up that tiny little box again and paste things in there. You do all that here. And the new stuff uh, with some of that, right, like if we take a look at you know, view formatting, there's no wizard right now, but if we start from scratch, we can see we can start to do row formatting right here. We can hide our list headers, right? So the same kind of stuff is applying here. Um, you'll see all of this stuff is working and being applied. Um, it's pretty easy to work with. A couple other your, your schema reference is still wrong, so I need oh, to yeah. that, so never mind. Yes. <laughs> Just noticed that, sorry. Oh, sorry. My goodness. Yeah, so if you guys weren't aware, the, the schema is no longer these uh, pnp.com uh, ones here, okay? Uh, and all of the samples reflect those if you're looking for that. All the documentation has been updated as well. Let me, let me start first. One other thing to note, so, oh, I didn't show you. So you can open these directly from a view, right? So load from the view. Uh, right now I'm in my local workbench, so that's not going to work out. Um, but you can also save directly to views. All that kind of stuff you've come to expect from column formatters here. There's several other new things. All right, so if I go back into that severity, and I hit OK, I'm going to customize it because I'm going to get out of the wizard. Right, 
the tree view has been drastically updated here to give you a property pane. Uh, so you can come in here and you can turn debug mode on and off, right? If you do the side by side, you can see it's actually updating the code, right? You can say text content is dog, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's also got this idea of, well, let's actually not show that, uh, of a script editor, right? So you'll be able to do Excel style expressions right there. Um, right now you're doing it all inside strings right here and you don't get IntelliSense with that. The expression editor, you'll be able to do that and get IntelliSense on those Excel style expressions. So you'll know when you forgot a closing parenthesis or if you forgot to include the else condition, um, all that stuff. Uh, it give you completion so you remember that you can do cosine, right, and sine, and you can do the two locale strings. All that kind of thing is there. Uh, I'm trying to think, is there anything else I need to show here? No, uh, can you, can you, Chris, okay, and this is, this is absolutely a brilliant solution. Now, just to clarify, can you go back on the, let's say, warrior horses and showing one of the sites and, and everything else on the tab? So, because I want to talk about the, the sample which you just showed, which is an absolutely brilliant web part from Chris Kent. Now, many, some in this call might be, raising their hand being like, why isn't Microsoft providing that kind of an editor? Why is Microsoft only providing a text box where you actually can paste in JSON? Um, and the reality on that one is that writing that kind of an end-to-end -end editor is really time consuming. So Chris has started uh, creating that editor way back already. Um, and sure, we in Microsoft are looking into potentially have a, some sort of a UI editor potentially at some point, maybe. Now, for time being, we've been prioritizing the behavioral uh, functionality, so making sure that everything is working, because unfortunately we do not have also infinite resources. Um, at some point, it, so who knows, it might be that whatever Chris has done could be potentially exposed somewhere in SharePoint Online, who knows, or then we actually implement uh, the, our out-of-the-box capability using the innovation and then it reference what Chris has done. Um, so. Uh, as, a, as a starting point. Now, for now, it is a SPFX solution. Uh, you are able to deploy that to your any tenant. Uh, you can, do we have an SPPKT file yes. in, the, in the GitHub? So you can actually download the SPPKT file from GitHub and just track and drop to the app catalog and voila, it is available for you within your tenant. So it's relatively easy. Uh, it is an open source, uh, so that means that it's a community supported, not supported by Microsoft. And that is a really big thing as well, obviously from both sides. So Sure, it is an open source, not directly supported. So if something happens within the web part, uh, well, it is a open source web part. Now, and that's really one of the key points why we in Microsoft haven't actually implemented this editor yet in the in the out of the box SharePoint UIs. Because in our case, whenever we implement that, it has to be working 100%, or we will actually cause additional cost for our support because then people will be asking why isn't it working properly. So it is kind of, I'm just being me, being transparent and open on these things. It's, um, it's um, one of these things that um, it is a resourcing challenge for us to actually make this happen right now, but whatever Chris is providing is a great start. Hopefully that made sense inside a certain level. I'm sorry, Louis, if you started uh, sleeping. I, I do apologize for that. Now, uh, <laughs> the second thing, uh, <laughs> Louis had the image, come on. <laughs> the second thing I wanted to actually mention uh, is the, there was a question around, can I uh, add a button which will activate something in the, in the UIs and all of that? Uh, so uh, can I add a button which would uh, execute some code? And the answer is actually no. And sorry, Louis, once again, I will do apologize if this is a sleeping topic for you, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands the reasons behind of these things as well. The reason behind of that is that uh, we cannot expose for the end users the capability for them to inject code, because that would be a script injection exception. So uh, the modern SharePoint experience is in SharePoint Online, by design, require a tenant administrator to approve the code, which will actually then execute script within your SharePoint Online. Now, if you, uh, and that's for the modern experiences by default. And that means that in these functionalities where you track and drop a JSON, for example, to the column formatting definition or for a view uh, definition, we do not provide you capability of having JavaScript executed. If you need to have something complex, uh, to execute, uh, you can always implement your own SP uh, SharePoint framework extension and then go through the governance of getting it approved in App Catalog and voila, it, it is absolutely available. Hopefully that did make sense uh, and, and clarifies uh, the, the support related on scripts. 
um, are you trying to find something, Chris, just out of no. curiosity? Or are you just, you're, just, just, showing yeah. you're just showing functionalities. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> get, the repo. get all the samples. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's a lot of samples available. Uh, and these are really downloading the JSON file, track and drop that in, in the column form, uh, format or, or view formatting in the future, and boof, it will magically work. Sure, there might be some uh, dependencies on the structure of the list or the fields, uh, but those are written in the readme file as well. Now, if you want to contribute, feel free to contribute as well, uh, uh, and contribute your samples to this repo as well. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Cool. I think that's it for this one. Patrick, let's thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for the great demo. Patrick had a, a we wanted to do another demo, another clarification on preview capabilities around migration tooling for OneDrive in SharePoint Online. All right. Patrick, there we are. So share cool. my screen. Um, so this, uh, it's always dangerous to follow Chris uh, for a demo. Um, <laughs> yes. But, uh, so what uh, I wanted to show uh, today is uh, one of the, so my real job uh, outside of the PNP world, but what, what I, you know, really am employed to do is to work at Fast Track and help people uh, with their migrations and doing uh, migrations from generally on-premises to the cloud or from uh, other services uh, to our cloud services, to our Microsoft cloud services. And inside FastTrack, um, this is just a little bit of background for what I'm about to show you, is uh, inside FastTrack we have a whole bunch of tools that are uh, completely proprietary and closed source and nobody gets to see them or use them uh, unless you're working with FastTrack. And that's cool, but um, uh, some of us are pushing now inside Fast Track um, for this idea, because Microsoft is very much uh, a different company than it has been in the past. We're very much about open source. And so we're starting to ask the question, why can't some of our migration tooling be open sourced and available uh, out there to the community? And we see a lot of uh, opportunity there uh, with the idea that not everybody uh, can work with Fast Track or necessarily qualifies to work with Fast Track uh, through all the various uh, machinations of sales stuff and whatnot. But why not allow the self-service tooling out there into the world and then also get feedback on it on how we can make it better? And that benefits us uh, internally because we can use the tools and it benefits folks trying to migrate to our stuff. Why not make that as easy as we possibly can? So this is our first effort towards that. And what you're seeing is actually an Electron app. So we're trying to embrace some of the cross-platform ideas of using uh, like Electron in this case. And so this is based on uh, a lot of the PNP JS work is in there. Uh, it's based on React. We're using the Flux data pattern uh, for folks that might be familiar with that. And all of it is in TypeScript. So we're going to end up as well, not just with this application, but uh, hopefully some tutorials and some guidance around how to set up a VS Code project to do an Electron app in TypeScript and actually be able to debug it uh, and exciting stuff like that. So what you're seeing is uh, an application that is going to be, uh, it's not available now, it's the, the repository is still private, um, and it's going to be private for a little bit longer, but wanted to give folks a preview into and a little bit of insight into kind of where we're, you know, the, the ideas we're trying to pursue here. And so the scenario we're talking about today is this idea that we uh, have a whole bunch of on-premises file shares, so local file shares, um, that are accessible through some directory path, and we want to migrate those to uh, OneDrive. So what we would do is uh, we could import some users, um, but trust me, I've already imported a couple of users. We're now going to log in using the device login flow that's happening here in this window. So you take that little code, paste that in here. Um, I'll log in as one of my many hundreds of accounts to a trial tenant. And so we've got logged in and our app uh, momentarily will refresh. And so now we can actually go look at our folks. And so you can see we've got a couple of folks here. And what we're going to do is run the checks. And so what this is going to actually do is run out to uh, the Graph API. We're going to take our access token we got, call the Graph API, 
And what we're doing now, these checks are pre-checks. So you can see I passed, um, so I'm all set up, and we can come and look at our log here. And so we're essentially saying, does the person have a license? Uh, do they have a OneDrive set up? Is the OneDrive there? Uh, you know, can we resolve whatever that source folder is going to be? Um, you know, and so forth. So we're running all these pre-checks, and we can expand that list. And then we can see here, uh, for Jamie, his pre-check, his one pre-check there has failed. Um, and so you're actually seeing uh, a work in progress. So one of the things we'll be doing is creating that OneDrive uh, if it doesn't exist. Um, but right now we're failing because it doesn't exist, and, and I haven't written the code to create it uh, as where we're at. Um, so that's uh, kind of that. We've got settings, and all of this is being done with web workers and things like that. Um, and you can log out. So that's kind of cool. But the other piece I wanted to show is uh, the ability. So we have this set up now. Um, obviously, this is Visual Studio Code. Um, and we have all our actions and flux uh, classes and things like that and our React components. Um, but we can actually do F5 debugging uh, of this application, which takes uh, a little bit of setup. Uh, but if we look at uh, our user structure, let's look at the auth store. Um, we will do, 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 do app state, app state, login in. So let's put a breakpoint there right in Visual Studio Code. Um, this is going to take a second to spin up. We can actually see that if we look at the terminal window here. Failed to compile. Well, that's unfortunate, isn't it? Why did we fail to compile? Demo gods. Demo we, were, gods. we were literally just running on the exact same code base. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I know, right? I, who knows? <laughs> It worked on my machine, uh, or my time. No, never mind. <laughs> Unable to create cat, disk cat, do, 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 do. That's all very interesting. I've never even seen that error before. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Well, it's a demo, so that's fine. So we'll give this a second to start up. But uh, So we're hoping then to share as well, because open source sharing is carrying um, a lot of our learnings around how to set up these projects uh, so you can, in Electron, uh, if you're not familiar, there's two main uh, or two key processes. There's the main process that actually is the app, and then there's a renderer process. Uh, the renderer is a funny word to say if uh, you say it a lot in a day, but uh, that actually runs. So that's your browser process that's running uh, inside the kind of Electron container. And uh, there we go. So now we can reload this, or maybe we need to reload in this one. Either way, um, but you can see as things are failing, we are actually getting breakpoints. Um, demos always go so smoothly. But so now, if I do my fake login, uh, my breakpoint went away, so we didn't hit it. Um, that's great. Let's try it again. Ah, well, it's a demo, so it's failing. But uh, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> we'll try one more time. Uh, I swear that there is a thing when I'm sharing my screen, stuff stops working. That's, yeah, it's the... So if we do our fake... Hey, there we go. So you can see we've now hit our breakpoint. We're actually debugging inside the Electron app. Um, and the way you do that uh, is by actually hooking up uh, to Electron Support's remote debugging. So you actually have to do a little setup in the runtime args for Electron. And then you're actually uh, inside... Uh, you're doing Chrome debugging. So you're not doing a Node debugger, you're doing a Chrome debugging, which you install a little extension for that. Uh, but hopefully we'll get all this written up uh, so folks can see uh, how that all works and uh, we can share some of our learnings from that. But uh, So that's a quick preview of what we're working on. Not uh, much to show uh, at this point in the demo beyond that, but where we're heading with this is the idea that we can run these pre-checks and then we can actually run the migration uh, of these things through the same tool. Uh, so this would be uh, really great for small to medium-sized companies, even large companies that maybe um, don't qualify for the fast track uh, benefit or fast track access or whatever it's called, but um, you know still have a need to easily move. We can share some of the tooling and some of the methods 
uh, that we're using uh, internally out there to folks uh, and hopefully make those journeys as easy as possible. So this is something we hope to have out in the next couple of months and uh, we'll, we'll obviously make some more announcements and things as we get closer, uh, but we'll definitely be pushing for feedback, and uh, this will be something open source, so if folks are interested in contributing and uh, helping out with this, this will be another opportunity um, that sits uh, slightly outside of patterns and practices, uh, which is, uh, but very much in the idea of patterns and practices that it's all about making folks' uh, lives easier and working with uh, the cloud technologies easier. Um, so we'll be stressing those same kind of ideas uh, around sort of this fast track open source initiative. So you can think of it as a as a partner initiative or however you want to phrase it, but. Um, Definitely the same ideas. So I wanted to share that out for folks. And let me glance to see if there's any questions. There was a good um, question around, is that source code available? When would it be available? Any timelines or anything uh, related on this? Okay, so to that question, that is a great question. And um, <laughs> That is a great Microsoft, actually, always come back. So. Yeah, great so question. it's a great question. <laughs> and I don't have a firm answer because we have – so. To be super honest, this could actually never be available. I've got meetings this week uh, to get this approved to essentially move forward as a project. And so if it doesn't get approved, well, it's not going to move forward. But um, I feel good that it's going to. I, I mean, I don't think it's going to get denied. But we will uh, – yes, I know I'm sharing my screen. Thank you. Um, but we will uh, – hopefully in the next couple months, this will be out and available um, and as that becomes available, hopefully those articles and everything will be ready, and it'll kind of come out as a as a one uh, piece of stuff. So the articles about debugging and how to set up, as well as the source code and the application itself, uh, we're targeting. Uh, so what is it? August. Uh, so by mid to late October is our is our target. Um, that could change. It could come sooner or later. Uh, we'll see how things go. But that's the target. We will get this stuff out there for folks um, and uh, see what we can do. So this one was super, super, super early preview. Now I have to the, – Yes, yeah, super the, early on preview. The, on the Microsoft uh, standard answer. So this is a ending on this call anyway. So it's the, the right answer of doing is that – great question. But in the fullness of time, can you submit your uh, request in the user voice? Wouldn't that be the ultimate Microsoft <laughs> matrix move? Yeah, but I'll be honest, I don't need another channel to go check. <laughs> yeah. Great question. In the fullness of time, can you actually submit a user voice and request? Um, no. I'm going to move back on the slides. We have two minutes. If there's any any ad hoc uh, late last minute questions, which we missed. Uh, or any good shows which we want to actually still get recorded. Uh, actually, it seems to be that the recording worked. Uh, there was a few hiccups on the audio on my side, but this isn't too bad. Crossing fingers. When will PMP Swag be available? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so just to clarify what that actually means. So um, uh, during earlier this week, apparently I was just asking if, if people would be interested on the model where we start selling uh, random PMP Swag, uh, SharePoint with the SharePoint logos, Microsoft logos, PMP statements like uh, sharing is caring and all of that, and everything would go as uh, directly to charity. And there was a massive interest on this one. Uh, uh, so we're looking into uh, potentially moving forward with this. Uh, I'm currently having discussions with our marketing and our my management chain to see what is the right model, so how official we want to make this. So um, sure, Orange Hoodies with uh, Dear Visa, uh, hashtag Dear Visa is, is apparently one of the tasks. <laughs> so all good. <laughs> but we'll see when we get it up. Uh, it is in progress. I'm we're trying to make it happen as fast as possible. So please, 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 was one, uh, dear Vesa was one. Uh, uh, can you submit that in user voice? Probably is a good one as well. <laughs> so, and we're looking into actually, <laughs> there is an ongoing effort. Actually, this is now on Chris Kent's uh, table to think about uh, the PMP mascot uh, story. So sorry, Chris, just a reminder on that one <laughs> because <laughs> you didn't reply on the task on the mission. But we're looking We've chosen into a mascot. To be clear, we're not releasing it yet, but we. We've chosen. No, that's true. We've chosen a mascot. Yes, we're still trying to figure out um, the actual look and feel of it, because apparently Usher has an open source mascot, and other people have an open source mascot. So of course we need to have an open source mascot. Um, and 
and most likely it will have a cape. So <laughs> we'll see. Cool. I, I think <laughs> that's it for this one. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for your input around the muskets and BMP swag and all of that. Uh, thank you, Chris, for a great demo. Um, uh, the video re and Patrick for the great preview on hopefully future stuff coming on the open source side of the store uh, house as well. Um, the video will be uh, available in the YouTube channel within 24 hours. Um, there will be announcements in social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, when the video is available. Or you can subscribe to the video channel, and you will know when it's available. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and please, please, please keep the feedback coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.